So if anybody out there can hear me, you let me know. so I hope you'll bear with us through any glitches we might have. So, 
Tonight we celebrate a table tennis milestone and the American who made an impossible dream come true. Chuck Poe grew up in a small Pennsylvania town far from any table tennis facilities. He was a very good classical pianist and an even better chess player. He was one of the few to have won a game against Bobby Fischer. He went to Marietta College in Ohio and was a software engineer most of his life. It was in college that he took up table tennis. By all accounts, Chuck was not a top player, but a rather good one nonetheless, a chopper, pick hitter. He won his college championship, was good enough to do halftime exhibitions at basketball games, and he won all the Fort Gordon tournaments while drafted and assigned there during the Vietnam War. He once had a win against the 2100 player. I guess you could say that he and I might have been at a similar level. That is, until sometime in the 1970s, uh, during a Virginia versus Maryland match. He remembers it was against Herb Horton when he heard an awful snap crunch sound in the small of his back. Truth is, he wasn't enjoying playing against the sponge players anyways. <laughs> but our real story begins here. Chuck's love of table tennis didn't diminish. It was just redirected into an obsession for collecting. <coughs> Apparently, it started with stamps. Then, of course, postmarks, postcards, paddles, of course, balls, nets, books, pictures. Then would come medals, badges, trophies, movies, programs, lithographs, old box sets, brochures, rule books, magazines, advertising, official documents. Then there were the paintings, artwork, comic strips, clothing, porcelain, jewelry, ornaments, music, poetry, ball holders, patents, trademarks, scorekeeping devices, autographs, <coughs> great players, celebrities playing table tennis. What kinds of patterns? Sponge bats, hard bats, sandpaper bats, wood bats, cork bats, waffle bats, strong bats, aluminum bats, leather, brown glass, sterling silver, painted, inlaid, carved, foam, ivory, textured, grooved. The balls, every kind imaginable, celluloid, plastic, seamed, double seamed, unseamed, textured, cloth cover, web cover, cork, paper mache, balls endorsed by Coleman Clark, Pagliaro, McClure, Miles, Barnum, Ehrlich, Freundorf, and Leach, balls used at World Championships, the Olympics, and balls used on kitchen tables in the 1800s. Naturally nets, six inches, six and three quarters inches, 10 inches, tight mesh, wide mesh, crochet, clamped, hand tie, freestanding, wire nets, wooden nets, brass nets, decorative nets, I obviously could go on and on, but then we'd be here all night. We probably would, but we'll be here all night anyway. <laughs> By the early 1990s, Chuck realized that mass accumulation uh, wasn't enough, that he needed to design the growing collection to achieve a balance between technical, cultural, and sport history. Although his life was turning away from software engineering, his high-tech skills were about to become extremely valuable again. I met Chuck a little over 10 years ago on eBay. We were both bidding on something. Chuck emailed me and we became friends. I told him I could digitize some of his old films. He told me about the Table Tennis Collectors Society, an international group who all know each other and interact with a fascinating mixture of scholarly cooperation and cutthroat competition. They publish books and journals, research papers, and argue incessantly over historical minutiae. By the late 1990s, Chuck's massive stash was the largest and most important collection of historic table tennis ephemera in the world. And Chuck was considered the world's foremost expert on the game's early history. Then in 2003, the ITTF noticed and they worked out an arrangement whereby the collection would be housed in their newly built chateau in Lausanne. Chuck would live in the chateau and create the first international table tennis museum. This was always his dream. After 30 years of countless personal sacrifices, he would have the chance to share the sport's legacy with the entire world. To maintain the highest possible standards, he has donated an additional $100,000 of his own limited funds to the museum. Chuck has been living in Lausanne now for five years. 
He interacts daily with ITTF officials, dignitaries, and great players from every country. The museum is arguably the highest profile table tennis entity in the world. I had the privilege of finally meeting Chuck in person at the museum shortly after he moved there, and I never learned so much about the game as I did during Chuck's colorful tour. Here's a picture I took in uh, Lausanne when I visited Chuck. And uh, yeah, you can leave it on that one. This, is, uh, this was uh, Chuck uh, on my visit to Lausanne. Uh, Chuck has done what even Ogie Moore tried and failed to do. The scope of the museum is staggering. Ten rooms, the entire ground floor of the chateau. Every conceivable artifact is there on display, along with life-size figures, a theater, even touchscreen flat panel television monitors from which visitors can watch footage of great players. And Chuck did it all. If you love table tennis, a vacation to Lausanne has become the ultimate pilgrimage. The museum entertains visitors daily, and Chuck plays every role, curator, architect, and docent. He is there literally 24-7. Recently, a group of internationally respected museum experts visited the museum and stated that it was the finest sports museum they have ever seen. In addition to building and running the museum, Chuck stages exhibits at world championships and other major events, such as in Shanghai, Bremen, and Zagreb. And the exhibit of the up upcoming Yokohama Worlds is next. Single handedly transporting display cases and one of a kind <clears throat> artifacts, his tireless work has brought the game's legacy to fans around the world. As if that's not enough, he also writes a monthly column for the ITTF magazine and is also the editor of the Table Tennis Collector, the journal of the Table Tennis Collector Society. Chuck does not seek personal attention or personal gain of any kind for his work. Quite the opposite. Yet ITTF's handing to him the reins of the First International Museum and what he has accomplished in this role has, to his own surprise, made him an international table tennis celebrity. What a proud moment this is for us to thank this gentle, kind, and solitary man from small town Pennsylvania for giving the world its first international table tennis museum. His work has touched and will continue to touch table tennis fans around the world for years to come. We salute Chuck Hoey's monumental contribution to the sport of table tennis. tonight because of uh, health reasons. He wants to make sure to be able to trip, make the trip to Yokohama and, and he's trying to get back in physical shape so he can do that. But he did send us a whole bunch of pictures and I'm going to try to zip through them as quickly as you can so you can get a feel for what the, this, the magnitude of, of the museum that he's created. So um, uh, we can go through and I'll, I'll read to you if you can't see in the back the things that he said on his slides. So go ahead. <coughs> so that's Chuck there on the left, the founder and curator of the ITTF Museum. To the U.S. Table Tennis Hall, I'm going to try to move this so I can read here. To the U.S. Table Tennis Hall of Fame, thank you for this great honor. Congratulations to Danny for his Lifetime Achievement Award and to Hank, Ilya, and Bill for their induction. So sorry I could not join you tonight. Please accept my humble apologies. Some health and other issues make it difficult to travel. This digital presentation will tell you about my contribution to our sport. How it all began, small town boy, south of Pittsburgh, played in college, 1960s, loved the sandpaper game, chopper, pick hitter, adopted classic hot, hard bat, loved that sweet spot sound, just a club level player, favorite player, Nate Sussman, sponge racket, well you can see what he thinks of this one. <laughs> How it all began, part two. Postal chess game, opponent in Sweden, sent move with this stamp. I wonder if there are more table tennis stamps. Hmm, a very expensive question. The collecting disease spread rapidly. Stamps and postmarks, rackets and balls, box sets, lithographs and engravings, books, medals, cards, programs, historic photos, celebrity photos, over 5,000 pieces. 30 years later, world's finest collection, heart happy, wallet sad. <laughs> The next step, promote the collection via the internet. He created a website, 2,000 plus photos. This was a fabulous website, by the way, and it's only gotten better. If you haven't visited the, the website, I strongly encourage you to do so. It's now housed at the ITTF 
uh, site. Somebody noticed 17th century Swiss chateau near Alps in Lake Geneva, entire ground floor for the museum, 10 grand rooms, residence suite on the top floor. So Chuck lives on the top floor, the middle floor is the ITTF headquarters, and the ground floor is entirely the museum. The ITTF is actually my third museum. The second is at the Australian Grand Slam Tennis Open, where my former tennis collection will become their museum, augmented by another major collection. By the way, he has also a badminton collection that he's trying to work out a, house, a home for it. His first museum, many years ago on a business trip to Germany, my appendix decided to burst. The doctor said it had an unusual pattern of perforation, so they put it in their pathology museum. <laughs> The work never ends. Gosh, I don't know if I want to read all this stuff to you, but there's, there's some interesting stuff. There's a museum shop, uh, uh, website, of course, the multilingual signage you have to do. Um, I, I should mention that uh, he saved the ITTF about $100,000 because he personally figured out ways to set up display cases that were significantly cheaper than their um, uh, companies that they enlisted to come in and do it. So now you get to see the museum, the reception area for the painting of the chateau and an entrance to the museum. Meet Adam and Eve playing the first game of table tennis, 1890. This is the only known example of this game to survive. It used strong rackets and a 30 millimeter rubber ball covered in white cotton. He calls this racket mania. Here's a bunch of early strong rackets and a book uh, from, uh, from 1576 showing the ancestor of racket sports with Joe de Pont. I probably pronounced that wrong, sorry if you're orange. Uh, fascinating group of early rackets, metal, silver, velvet, hand carved, pistol grip, racket encased in celluloid, and racket with carved wood hips. Stunning room celebrating the new game that was all the rage after the introduction of the American invented cellular ball. Check out the ceiling, it says. First ball for table tennis, 1890, rubber core with cloth, co cloth cover, 30 millimeter. The strong balance was unsuitable. Second ball, 1891, cork center, covered with cotton webbing, 50 millimeters, not effective due to poor balance. There's your first celluloid ball, 1899 to 1900. 30 mil 38 millimeter, perfect balance. Uh, check out that seam, though. <laughs> Earliest books on table tennis. The library has over a thousand volumes in many languages, the world's largest collection. One of two classic era rooms with tributes to Victor Barna, Bergman, Belak, and other great stars. Copy of a painting from the finals of the 1949 U.S. Open Championship, uh, thanks to Marty Reisman. I'd like to add that the uh, gentleman who first proposed that Chuck Bowie be inducted into the Hall of Fame was Marty Reisman. One of two classic era rooms. With, oh, no, I'm sorry. They already did that. <laughs> Age of Technology room. Uh, this is a recent acquisition of the museum, the, the table that was used in the 1961 World Championship Finals. Modern Olympics era room, including a torch from the 1988 Olympics, uh, rackets from the World Championships and other Olympic gold medals. Here's a touch screen video exhibit uh, uh, showing two minute best point highlights of all Olympic singles finals. Uh, Thanks, thanks to someone for the video editing. Five additional touch screen uh, exhibits are in the development stages. Exhibit honoring Jimmy McClure, also gold, silver, bronze medals from the 95, 03, 05, and 07 worlds. I should add that uh, Chuck has been very careful to feature a lot of American great players in the museum, so we're lucky that we have an American in charge of that museum. Interactive game room. By the time you get through this museum, you really want to play. So he's got a table set up with a robot and room to play. Um, and that was actually a table from the 05 World Championships in Shanghai. Uh, there's the website, ittf.com slash museum. One click to table tennis history. You'll, you'll never get through all the pictures on that page, by the way. Uh, let's see, bi-monthly online newsletter. Um, let's see here. And you, and you can download that from the website. Uh, and then there, there's a quarterly online journal as well uh, for the Table Tennis Collector Society, also downloadable on that uh, web page. Uh, two million of these downloaded in 2008. 
Um, here's the upcoming exhibit at the Oklahoma Worlds. Fans really enjoy it. One visitor wrote that in the guest book. <laughs> <laughs> Here's one of the uh, rotating exhibits, uh, this one from the 2005 World Championships. My, exhi my exhibitions sometimes have side benefits. We had eight uh, trained uh, uh, docents. Some American gems. Uh, here's original oil paintings on a couple of rackets, 100 plus years old. Cut glass trophy presented to Jimmy McClure in 1936 Prague for the first of his three consecutive men's doubles world championships titles. The 1937 world championship medal presented to Jimmy McClure and the American team members for winning the Swaithley Cup for the men's team. Autographed photo from the 1936 world championships of the incomparable Ruth Aarons, who still holds the record for the youngest player ever to win the world singles title at 16 and the only American ever to do so. He, uh, he has added the museum needs a Ruth Aaron's racket. Here's some hundred plus year old rackets. The collection has over a thousand of these kinds of rackets. Some more, an early box set by Spalding and Milton Bradley, superb color lithographs. This is an entire set of uh, historic porcelains made by Royal Beirut for the 1904 World Saint, World's Fair in St. Louis. Each delicate piece has an American flag and a table tennis motif. So all friends of table tennis are invited to visit the museum, a beautiful setting in the heart of the Olympics community in Lausanne, Switzerland. I might add that picture at the upper right is the view out of his room on the top floor of the uh, museum of the Alps. Heartfelt thanks to Chairman Dick Evans, the U.S. Table Tennis Hall of Fame Board of Directors, and everyone who supported this nomination. I'm especially grateful to Karen Lapp and Scott Horn for their friendship, belief in my work, and recognition of the museum as an important contribution to our sport. This is a great honor that I will forever cherish. I invite all of you to visit our monument to table tennis. So that's what Chuck had to share with us tonight. So I'm going to turn things back to uh, uh, to Dick.
defrag that hard. Yeah.
And it's not hard to see why. In 1990, he and Zoki won the doubles in the Europeans over 89 world champions, Jord Rostov, Stefan Fetzner. They also won the US Open, knocking out the strong Swedish teams of Eric Lim, Jorgen Persson, and Jan Ove Walker, and Kel Appelgren. We need a shot of Appelgren and Walden. Oh, that's Persson. Get ahead of here. Get a little <laughs> All right, we'll pick it up here. I don't know what happened to Walter. Wait a minute! What the hell? All right. It's not. Can you find? Can you find <coughs> Walter and Alvin? Chicago's Robert Blackwell. 
In the five years since he'd been out of the States, Luby had picked up another European championship, the mixed doubles. Where has this been? <laughs> Can we pass up a little shot? 
Never mind. Four titles for Luffy and Killer Spin at the 2003 Nationals. In the men's singles, runner up Kaczynski, that's far left, Kaczynski far left, helped Luffy out by the offer in Shimon. He's next to Adam Hugh, who's on the far right. And it, and it, I know. We're getting there. And in the men's doubles, David himself, as if there were no hard feelings between them, that's the shot I showed you before, paired with Luffy for the win. Yasna and Luffy were, of course, competitively victorious in the mix. In 2004, Luffy qualified for his fifth Olympics. But at the Nationals, he looked like he gained weight and was slower. He lost to Juan, 11 9 in the sixth. By the time of the 2005 Nationals, Luffy, yeah, Luffy was better, sharp. Playing in a German game had given him focus. His team was in first place, and he and Kara had the best doubles record in the league. That is not. They already showed that. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Something's wrong with our synchronization. I don't think I've noticed that. But still, it's not something. So, Kara helped him prepare for the Nationals. Yep, and practice twice a day. Damn it. Returning the third ball, felt he could get into a rally, being able to return ball after ball would give him a psychological advantage. Go to Luffy's backhand, someone had said, and he's 29.50. Go to his forehand, and he's 26.50. But regardless, he has a great table game and won't give you a free ball. Sure enough, Luffy was back winning the closed singles and the doubles with his <laughs> At the March 2006 Arnold Fitness Weekend in Columbus, Ohio, the ESPN Invitational matches featured Luffy playing an exhibition with former doubles partner Primrose. Ed Hogshead describes how at one point left-hander Luffy Lescu was forehand looping to Primrose. When after about seven power loops, Primrose countered to Luffy Lescu's backhand catching him off balance and fanning away from the table. But Lupulescu, with his back to the table, hit a backhand, overhead, kill shot for a winner. <laughs> the entire audience stood up and exploded with applause. Even the other international players, like Mr. Gray over there, were shaking their heads in disbelief. Primrats looked at the umpire and put up two fingers to end the game. He thought the shot was worth two points, whereby the umpire complied. Yeah. At the 2006 close, Lupi, noticeably tired because out of shape, again lost to Zhuang. Larry Hodges wrote that David is very comfortable against Lupi's stuff and has a long history of beating lefties, often with angled cross court blocks to the forehand followed by down-the-line blocks from the back end. David loves to play Loopy, said David's coach and wife, Joni Fu. But I don't think Loopy likes to play David, not with all the tricky shots that David uses. Loopy says he does tricky shots, too, tricky shots, too. But there weren't enough of them this year. Here's David. Here's David. I like this. Here's David after winning his 2006 close, racing to tell Joey how much he likes to play Luffy. <laughs> However, there's always another year, isn't there? Just 12 days before the 2007 Nationals, Luffy was in the hospital with kidney stones. First time he was ever sick, he said. But the crisis passed. <laughs> And Luffy won his fourth national singles championship and his fourth national doubles title in the Zensky. In 2008, Luffy, of course, continued winning tournaments. But, okay, enough. I'm sure you all get the idea of deserving Luffy is and the honor we give him tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our current national champion, Ilya Luffy Lupulescu, to our team.
thank you again and thank you for everybody who, who supported me for this nomination. Thank you.
please don't so. joke us about my time. Mm -hmm. This is the first time I've worn one in 20 years. This jacket is from 20 years. So and I have to read my speech because there's no way I can do it without it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm close enough to the mic if you can hear or not. Lift the mic up there. That's it. Okay. Thank you very much, Dick. And I want to thank all of the Hall of Fame members for voting me into the Hall of Fame. Of course, Dick would not tell me who voted for me. So I'm going to assume you all voted for me. And I will forever treat each one of you as if you actually voted for me. I want to thank you, Dick, for the bottom of my heart for your friendship and help over the past 40 plus years, up to and including my induction. No one really knows how very much I owe you. You're one of the finest human beings in our sport. And your wife, Sue, is one of the sweetest people. And you two are very lucky you found each other. Dick and I go way back to our Columbus, Ohio days. And again, I thank you very much. First of all, I want you to not worry about what I'm going to say. No controversy for me tonight. I'm just so happy to find you make it at this point. I forgive almost everyone who has hurt me, all the three people. I'll never publicly say anything else. <laughs> Jim and Dick are sitting there with their stopwatches. It's not to worry, I'll be up here less than 20 minutes. <laughs> 36 years ago, my good friend Joe and I drove to Las Vegas after he had been fired and I quit my job. We decided to live a month in Vegas. We rented an apartment and proceeded to have one of the funnest 30 days of my life. Joe went home the, with the lady to St. Louis, and when our rent was up, he went with her. I love Vegas so much that I wrote in my diary, I'd rather crawl out in the desert rather than leave Vegas. Soon I found where a few people played table tennis, and one of them was Neil Smythe. I found that Neil was a huge fan of table tennis, when I told him of my accomplishments, he wanted to play me and wanted me to coach him. Neil was really a big fan of table tennis, and so he got me a job at Caesar's Palace. The rest is history. <coughs> Neil and I became co-founders of the U.S. Close National Table Tennis Championship. It began with me asking Tim Hogan why there was not a national for U.S. citizens and U.S. Open for all other countries. Tim said no one had ever tried to put it together. I decided to do so, and Tim wrote an article about how I started to <coughs> rolling. Since Neil was a top executive in Caesars, I figured he'd be able to get the money for prize money and play the tournament in Caesars. Since I knew many of the players and top officials in our sport, I believed I could get the first U.S. flow sanctioned. That led to my incredible trip to Philadelphia, endless meetings with EC members, professional players, association members, and U.S. PPA officials. The table tennis topics for July, August 1976 carries my article headed. This is how it was from Caesars Palace to Philadelphia and back. I had written nonstop and it was 26 pages, single space, and I sent it to Tim telling him to do whatever he wanted to do with it. <coughs> Tim wrote back and written a fine, careful article. I don't see how I can put the thing in its entirety into the magazine. It runs 50 pages in normal, in normal double space. In fact, I don't know how, what the heck to do with this issue. I have 44 pages full already, and I'm budgeted for 32 pages. <laughs> Tim got it all in. I don't know how he did it. Anyway, in that article, I would like to quote what I wrote regarding my dear friend, Neil Smythe. Quote, in that article, I said, it was with apprehension that I called Neil. How could I convey the recent events in a short time? 
how could I possibly explain the way matters stood over the phone? It was at this point that I decided on trying to get the tournament from the USPTA that giving the Player Association 30 days in which to get in harmony with seizures in the USPTA. I felt that by getting the sanction, there was still hope. But if I withdrew the sanction or asked the EC members to vote against the sanction, there would be no tournament. With this in mind, I called Neil, end quote. Neil Smythe is, <laughs> everybody knows this, Neil Smythe is not an ordinary man. Those who know him, know him to be one of the kindest, gentlest, most compassionate men alive. He is truly a man who no one dislikes. Being this kind of man and job that he has, to me, is truly credible. Most men with his power could be hard, cruel, power-wielding, would not associate with uh, us little people. Neil is just the opposite. I was sure how he would respond. I wasn't sure how he would respond to my story. I knew he wanted the tournament for table tennis, not so much for Caesars. I also knew that he was a businessman and for Caesars, and that Caesars could not have had a tournament that might be plagued by pickets or other problems. In talking to Neil, I remember constantly telling him the situation was incredible, that it was impossible for me to tell of all the recent events, but I did give him the highlights. Neil was a great listener. Here I was, distraught, <laughs> and almost in tears, and after hearing all the facts in a calm voice, he says, what is your recommendation? Wow. Suddenly I felt good. It was like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. In effect, Neil was giving me his trust and blessing on how to handle the proposal. I proceeded to tell him I'd like to get the tournament and spend 30 days trying to get an agreement between Caesars, USPTA, and the Players Association. He agreed and told me to go ahead. The rest is history. I'd like now to apologize to you, Neil. Since you were inducted into the Hall of Fame, I have told several people and put in print that I was the founder of the Nationals. This year as I went through my thousands of table tennis pages, I realized how involved you really were. You was the guy everyone knew. They knew your phone number and where you worked, they went to you, and you filtered information, stuff to me. Due to time constraints, time constraints, let me just say, I'm very proud to be known as Bill Hodge, co-founder of Neil Spice of the USPTA National Championships. A final note regarding Neil. Something that touched my heart and made me cry was at the 2005 Hall of Fame, where at the end, Neil came to me, and he was crying. When he said, Bill, thanks for introducing me, introducing me to these members of this terrific sport. I was trying to, and I can't remember much after that, but you remember. I'll get through this. Next, I'd like to thank the one person who has done more work for table tennis in this country than anyone else, even more than me. Uh, <laughs> you know also who I mean. He is my good friend of over 30 years, and like me, a very passionate and caring person. He is known simply as Tim. <coughs> Thank you, Tim, for your volume eight, with Neil and my pictures on the back cover. Also, thanks for your sweet handwritten notes inside cover. Unfortunately, Tim, you have accomplished way too much for anyone to just pick out the highlights. I'm proud to be your friend and sincerely thank you for your help in so many ways over the years and up to and including helping me get to the Hall of Fame. One of my most prized possessions is a letter you wrote to Neil Smythe dated June 15, 1976. I won't read it all now, but a few things you wrote made me so proud. Quote, 
I'm writing this letter because I want you and everyone else out there to know how well, how almost miraculously, in these repaired cars and, and everything, it just didn't seem right. So I took it over. Anyway, uh, there's not much more. I won't read all of the John Tanner stuff. Okay, there are many more people I want to thank, so I'll be brief. I want to thank Pam, Pam Ramsey for our San Diego Table Tennis Association times together and for being one of my top advisors. I want to thank Steve Isaacson, who, like myself, found the need and filled it by founding this Hall of Fame. Others I'd like to thank for their long hours or long years of friendship are Robert Harrison, Mal Anderson, and Angie Rose Al Bingston. Angie let me use her home address for my mail when I first came to San Diego in 1983. I still have an address, an envelope with uh, her address on it, addressed to me. And in her husband, former world table tennis champion, Stellan Bingston, are coaching many kids in Southern California and should be commended for their hard work. They're coaching right now unless they've made it into the hall. There are three people I'd like to thank for all their hard work, and though I don't know them personally, I certainly do know the hard work they do for our sport. Ed Hogg, Hogshead, Isaac Jane, and Robert Blackwell. And finally, I wish to thank a past president who is no, no longer with us. He was a friend, and then he became unfriendly. But I still want to thank him for his service to our sport and for naming me, me to the board. His name is Saul Schiff. And Saul Schiff gave me the USPTA tie class and lapel class. I don't know if anyone else has them, but I've never seen it yet. These two little things. Finally, what I want to thank our new CEO, ED, Mike Kamenoff, for his outstanding work making our sport more professional. And with his USOC background and connections, he is leading us down the new and improved and one last page, a little bit about me. Most of it has been thanking people so I could do something bad. Uh, my journey to this point in my life has been interesting, exciting, unusual, controversial, fun, and much more. My early memory of table tennis in Columbus was when I worked in Integrity Supply and the first day there at noon Everyone got up with a lunch bag in one hand and a ping pong paddle in the other. I believe that was in 60-something. Anyway, I followed them into the warehouse where three tables were set up and they were playing doubles. From there, I discovered where the good players played in Old Tangibility Bowling Alley, down below the bowling. The tables were below the bowling lanes and had big concrete pillars to go around. Anywhere Anyway, from there, my pal Dick Evans, along with Bone Moe Lee and John Spencer, went together to form LES Associates and then a big hardware store at 2464 Cleveland Avenue. The store still had shelves, etc. So we all went to work fixing up the place to play and had six tables, a uh, display case, shower, locker in the basement, we had leagues, raining events, and big terms. Before long, we had DJ Lee as U.S. number one, and John Tannehill as U.S. number two. And I practiced a lot with both of them, as DJ didn't want John getting any better, so I had a big advantage there. Then in 72, I went to Vegas, and was there until 1980, when I went back to Ohio, and then to Dick's Mountaintop in Rennie Group, West Virginia. That was the story by itself. From there, I moved to San Diego, Angie's address, later got married, had my 22-year-old daughter, Sabrina. Then I went to San Diego, then I moved back to Colorado, back to San Diego, and to Yuma, where I've been for seven years, not playing. I was going to write down a lot of memorable things, but uh, just note a few, like marching into a packed football stadium in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, for the National Sports Festival. That is quite a thing with 60,000 people in, in the table tennis players all much in. Uh, the National Sports Festival, which then changed to U.S. Olympic Festival, 
and which is no longer held. And I sure wish it was. It's great for our youth and for U.S. players to be in an Olympic event. Uh, Mr. Kavanaugh might try to get something like that again. I remember when Mr. Ogimura came to Columbus for a coaching clinic, and I was one of the six, which included Ogus Opez, who I was sure would never be any good, but uh, I was wrong on that. <laughs> anyway, I was two-time VP of USPTA, wrote my hodgepodge articles for the magazine, giving the members inside the scoop. I was president of four very big clubs, very active, volunteer of the year for the Boys and Girls Club in San Diego. And finally, I'm proud that I was the only spectator of many PC meetings, which Tim, I'm sure, remembers. And I was playing in the tournament. Why would I do that? Why would I go to the EC meetings when I was playing in the tournament? Because I care and want to be informed and helpful. Then remember the bus ride to the Cobo Hall where the U.S. played China friendly matches in April 1472? I still have my green ticket, which was never torn in half as I was with the team and Rufford called in his team manager. I also have a picture uh, from Dell Suarez's Table Tennis Center showing Dell hitting the ball back by the barriers and behind him is DJ and me three, <coughs> and next to DJ is me. Finally, the end. Thanks for your attention and thanks for not going or kissing. And a special thanks to the Hall of Fame board. Now I need a drink. <laughs>
Lehigh Valley, Detroit, Indianapolis, Cedar Falls, Baton Rouge, Santa Clara, and Miami were all stops along the way that we made as a team. In January of 1985, Hank and I headed to the Angry Sport Club in Stockholm to help prepare for the World Championships in Gothenburg. Hank had very impressive results in Sweden and battled with a number of the top players while being coached by Lisa Sandberg. We ran into each other a number of times in local tournaments, and the outcome was never certain. I believe that was the first time we played at the end of the second. The special part, the special part of our relationship was no matter how hard we fought against each other on the table, the matches all the day on the table. I'm sure Hank hated losing to me as much as I did Hank, no matter if it was Sweden, Las Vegas, or Mason, and I did Our competitiveness helped both of us itself. Here's a shot of Hank, who was playing for Thailand next to drawing Brian Masters of Team USA, who qualifies in the 1985 World Championships in Gothenburg. Hank won that match, and he probably won't be matches in March. He played against Brian thereafter. Here's Hank with uh, Team Stiga and Brian Kasanovich from Toronto. As a teammate, it was great knowing that Hank was always prepared for the next match no matter what. Our epic 4 2 comeback come from behind history with Chen Yin Wong over a strong counter Musa led by Jeremy Smith in Detroit was made possible thanks to Hank's ninth match, Heroes in 1988. For those of you that remember that match, I never thought an international player was just the same serve so many times in a row. Later I realized that it wasn't simply getting the serve back, it was the only problem, but that stopping Hank's third ball attack was really the biggest problem in that match. That match earned Hank the MVP honors from the team. Hank also teamed up with Ricky and Randy, Lucian, and myself, to stop the Canadians that we were not nearly full of a watch on the scenes. There's two Chinese the team coach, it's always at the front side there. <laughs> with, that, with, while memories from Detroit and also Toronto were unforgettable, the one match that stands out the most to my mind was the 1989 Dortmund at the World Championships. As usual, Team USA was fighting for a spot in the first division. We were the underdog against a very strong Austrian team led by former Chinese star Ming Yi. With the score of 4 3 in our favor, Hank went out against the former Polish champ Stanislaw Freichek to seal the deal. Coach Danny Seemuller, Team leader Dennis Masters, IPTF rep Gus Kennedy, and the rest of the gang cheered Hank on on each and every point of the match. The excitement was truly indescribable. At the end of this talk, I'm actually going to show the final two points from that tie in Dortmund. Hank continued to represent the U.S. International and played a major role in helping us return to the first division in 1991 when we finished at 15. 1986 was truly a banner year for Hank and Singles, with a number of major titles both internationally and domestically. Here he is winning the men's singles at the CNEs. A shot from the Doolin All American that he won. And probably the most exciting one, beating him in the finals of the 1986 US Nationals. Not only did Hank win the men's singles in Pittsburgh, we won the men's doubles together, but then Hank along with Lisa G were one game away from winning for from winning the mix. Had he won that final game, he would have won all three, which is something only a few US players have ever done. In 1992, Hank just missed out by one spot for making the U.S. Olympic team for Barcelona. By being the first alternate, he represented the U.S. the following year in the Brazil and Japan Opens. In addition to being an accomplished athlete, Hank was a full-time student at George Mason University while getting his degree in international business. Currently, Hank is the CEO of the Crystal and Jewelry Company in Bangkok. Before I go to the video clip, I just asked a couple of players of who I played against for some short quotes that were kind enough to give them, and I thought I would share some of their thoughts. Perry Schwartzwood was the first to reply, so I'm going to get his. Uh, he beat Hank at the first time they played the under 2500 in the U.S. Open in 1984. This is what Perry said about him. I was fortunate to be both a team as well as an opponent of Hank during the early days. He possessed a piston-like hand motion on his serve which almost defied the ability and the amount of spin it imparted. 
Always I thought that I, along with Rick Simo, had top notch stores in the U.S., but I can safely say no one had a more effective serve than Hank. He was a warrior as a teammate and an incredibly fierce opponent. A wonderful strategist, he was someone that you wanted to have in your corner and that was never fun with seeing him to your opponents. If the USAT Hall is truly for the elite, then Hank is a truly worthy addition. The second person who I asked about it, when something's up, it's David Sakai, a local practice partner of Hank's. Dave said, remember Hank as a competitor who was one of the toughest, most tenacious competitors I've ever played. The service and server turn along with his great short game and strong move made him a great player. I thought I would end with one of Hank's biggest rivals who will be inducted right afterwards. Then he said, Charcha was a warrior. Like all champions, he had supreme confidence in his ability and he could feel it and play him. And it was so difficult to play because he had great serves and he could follow with the power of the room. These players know Hank as a player. I knew him as a doubles player, teammate, and one of my brother. Like I said earlier, he meant a lot to him, but he meant a lot to him. He was good. Their unconditional love and guidance 
have made me what I am today. I was treated as if I were a member of the family. The house was full of joy and laughter. I had a ball on the holiday drive. <laughs> Kathy, you were my first English teacher. You took me to school every morning in a white Chrysler with a quick one zip license plate. <laughs> you applied for my green card and we celebrated together when the mail came. You were at the major tournaments, sitting inside, uttering, Come on, Hank. <laughs> Kathy, you have been most kind. As for Pat, you are my true supporter. While Kathy was counting the score, you were standing and walking around nervously, asking who is winning. I recall when I won the singles at the Nationals in 1986 in Pittsburgh against Sean and the doubles with him. You took me to Belly Banks in the middle to buy a Monada watch to celebrate my victory. And to this day, I am still wearing it. <laughs> <laughs> Above all, you and Kathy were at my graduation from George Mason University to take part of my yet another achievement of mine. As for Sean, I thank you for being a great partner and a great rival. Your friendship and, unself and unselfishness of sharing the love of Pat and Kathy is still today echoing within me. I remember one of the interviews you gave to the US ATT magazine Spin. After losing at the Nationals, you said, Yes, I'm upset to lose, but the great thing is, the little the title is still within the family. Of course, Sean later made a comeback and beat the hell out of me <laughs> in many tournaments. The Olympic trials and the nationals in the semi-final, where he went on to claim the men's single title. Sean, your friendship has never stopped. Even some after, even after some 16 years since I left the States. And because of you who has campaigned vigorously to ensure my Hall of Fame candidacy, you are my true friend. Thank you, Sean. In all, I owe everything to this great sport. It brought me to America, to the only family, to my education, and lastly, to my wife, Nancy, who was unable to be here tonight, whom I met during the 1989 U.S. Open in Florida. Thank you, thank you, and thank you.
trophy Danny was awarded, all that convinced people he was indeed the champ. For 14 years at the USOTCs, from 1973 through 1986, Danny and his brotherly teammates enjoyed and suffered excruciating wins and losses. In 77, down 4-2 to the Bogan brothers and brought them to Barry. They pulled out a dramatic 5-4 win. But in 1984, they lost the 5-4 ninth match, 21-19 in the third heartbreaker, to Lee Kent, Fenuai, Charchai, Tika Barakip, Sean O'Neill, and Perry Schwartzberg. After the 74 US Open, Danny, taking over from DJ Lee, became the number one rated player in the US. Consequently, he'd be much interested in, in demand for exhibitions. Here, he's cordoned off by interested mall shoppers. Once, while barnstorming around, giving coaching clinics and putting on exhibitions at half times of basketball games. The Seamoners' car got stuck on a bridge in a snowstorm, and they had to dig their way out, looking all the while scared at seeing huge trucks suddenly looming down on them out of the blinding mist. The snowstorm became such a blizzard that they couldn't see the hood on their own car, so they had to stop, pull up in a turnpike restaurant for 82 hours. They slept on the floor without blankets, washed their hair, and John. Finally, they got what they've been looking for, visibility. Visibility. Did you ever get enough of that, Dan? We try to make amends tonight. At the 75 Calcutta Worlds, Seymour started to amass in second division Swaveling Cup play, an incredible record for consistently fine play. At Calcutta, he was 18 and 1. At Birmingham, 26 and 0. At Novi Sad, 19 and 0. Against recognizably good opposition, that's an amazing 63 and 1 record. If the U.S. had three Danny Seamers, someone said, they'd be number six in the world. How ambitious, how intense Danny was. Oh, if I were only living in Yugoslavia, he said dreamily. <laughs> then world runner-up, Tovas Pancic, would be my teammate, not my opponent. Trying to kill, not themselves, but just some time before watching the final matches in the 1975 Yugoslav Open, Danny, Ricky, and Mike Vallette decided to climb a hill or two behind the Tivoli playing hall. A scary mistake. They were stopped at the point of a machine gun, were frisked, their camera taken away, and then hands up, hoping they wouldn't be shot in the back, were forced to literally slide their way back down to level ground, whereupon they were taken into custody and held captive for several hours. I swear I never faced anything like this in my life, Danny would say later. Though he was talking about Wang Liang, the unbelievable Chinese chopper. Next, please. Yeah. They were just talking about the unbelievable Chinese chopper with the strange Tianjin rubber. He had to play in the Swedish Open. I couldn't return four out of every five serves, he said. In England, at the 75 Middlesex Open, a more aggressive Dan not only won the doubles with Brother Ricky, Brother Ricky, are you in the house? I'm here. All right. But he won the singles as well over the English number one, Dennis Neal. He also won the respect of English promoter Mike Wallace, who wrote our U.S. Association, how pleased he was that Danny was such a credit to American table tennis. Back in the States, Seymour faced Insukna Bouchon, a record 11-time U.S. women's champion, in a televised Battle of the Sexes show. The men in their respective sports, tennis player Bjorn Moore, golfer Hale Irwin, basketball star Jerry West, and others had to give their female counterparts a slight edge. Danny, for example, had to win the point by the eighth stroke. Later in the spring of 77, Danny would compete in the first of two CBS Bristol Myers sponsored World Rackets Championship. Squash, racquetball, tennis, table tennis, badminton. The gimmick was 
that these professionals had to compete in all sports but their own. Danny didn't do well at tennis, said he didn't know how to hit an overhead. But hey, whatever the racket with these sponsors, Danny looks pleased with himself. And why shouldn't he be? The two shows netted more than $9,000, and he didn't even have to play Danny. On into 1976 in controversy, the players had been disgusted with the horribly disorganized 1974 World Team tryouts, the poor playing conditions, the ridiculous number of matches, the lack of U.S. TTA supervision and support. And now, for the 76 U.S. Open in Philadelphia, this backwards trend continued. Only $1,500 in prizes for the individual events. The players had had enough. Here's Danny with one of his arch rivals, former Thai and Australian champion, Charlie Bubinich, picketing the tournament. But then, thanks to Neil Smythe and Bill Hodge, Bill Hodge in the house? Neil Smythe? <laughs> Danny began to accumulate the first of five national singles championships, 11 national men's doubles championships, eight in a row with Brother Ricky, and seven national mixed doubles championships. However, momentarily counteracting that success was Danny and Dave Sakai's bold try and subsequent failure to bring the 79 world championships to Hartford, Connecticut. The U.S. TTAEC was just too timid to back the project. Not only did the U.S. team score big at the 77 Worlds, advancing to the championship division in Swayman Cup play, but Danny and Ricky reached the quarterfinals of the men's doubles with a straight game win over China's number one seed, Bo Yuwa Liao Fu Men. It's so exciting, doesn't it? At the 77 US Open, Danny suffered two striking final game, final match losses. In, in singles, down 10 2 in the fifth to Germany's Jochen Weiss, he rallies to 15 all, but can't win it. In doubles, Danny and Ray Gillen are at deuce in the fifth against Weiss and Peter Stellway. You can't tell exactly whether he just won the point or lost it, but they just got an edge ball on him at deuce. Danny's not happy. The Germans scored an edge ball and won to win 22-20. Leis said he thought it unprofessional of Singer to holler after he'd won big games or worse points. Of course, he added, since there aren't any spectators in America, the only thing he can do is try to psych himself up. In 1980, at the suffocatingly hot Fort Worth Open, Danny teamed with Ricky for a clutch 25-23 in the fifth doubles win over Kasanovich and Gillen. Great expression on Gillen's face. This is Gillen. From 1978 to 1984, Danny's point at our was exceptional but he was mortal. Moreover, great champion that he is, he's always been ready over the years to technically and psychologically help a number of younger players, some of whose games he had the foresight to see would one day grow to contest his own. After beating Eric Bogan in the fall 1978 Nissan Open, a tournament Seymour regularly won, here he's pictured with the John Stillians Memorial Trophy, Danny confided prophetically that of the U.S. players, Eric had the best chance to beat him, Eric's brother Scott, the next best chance. In 78, Danny lost the championship to 15-year-old Eric. Damn the kid was good. <laughs> In 79, the new arrival at Telemachic. Get her! <laughs> Still hurts. Yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. 
In 81 to Scott Goldman, shown here losing in the final of the 78 seed in Eden County. Joe Scott. There you go. And in 84 to Eric again. But, I can't get it. He beat Eric. Look at this. Okay. He beat Eric in four U.S. clothes. Three in the finals in 80, 82, and 83. That last one shown here. Eric and I are constantly playing mind games out there, he said. Our table tennis is real table tennis. It's all about a lot of positioning, a lot of maneuvering. In 82, Dan said, his plan against Eric, good at blocking and countering, was to cut down the countering rallies, attack not his usual 70% but only 50% of the time. If I partially chopped, he said, I could then block back Eric's loops and sometimes get him out of position. This strategy also made him unsure of when I would attack. After losing the first, Danny ran out the second game from 2015 down, then won the fifth from 1916 down. This, he said, was the most memorable, his most memorable U.S. match. Eric and I remembered it too. <laughs> but the sea owners and the Vulcans, though great rivals, have also throughout been great friends. Danny's experience at the Worlds, he would represent the U.S. at eight such championships. And his perennial play in the Western Japan Open against the world champion Nobuhiko Hasegawa and other Japanese stars no doubt made him a better coach, contributed toward what he called his thinking man style. When he became our national men's coach, it, wasn't, it was only natural that he'd write articles for our magazine like Tactical Table Tennis Thinking. Only natural, too, that we'd see him as a color man for TV. Here he's working a match with Quipster announcer Jim McQueen. To prepare himself for playing the Chinese at the 83 Tokyo World, Danny had been reading the English table tennis magazine about Kai Jinhua's supposed weaknesses. And lo and behold, if Danny wasn't 10-8 up in the fifth over this bat twirling, 81, 83, world runner-up. But then the match was stopped for 15 minutes over discussion of the legality of Kai's foot stamping. And when play resumed, Danny lost nine of the next 10 points and his chance for the win of a lifetime. Then having married Valerie with a baby daughter, Sarah, it was time for him to retire. Not on your or his life. He not only played in the 86 closed in Pittsburgh, he directed it, as of course he has so many tournaments since, including the annual four-star Big Bucks Macy Block and St. Joe Valley Opens that would be so valuable to his South Bend students and the prestige of their club. After losing 18 and the fifth in that 86 close to Sean O'Neill, he didn't try out for the 87 U.S. Worlds team, but in 89, he became that team's coach. So let's see. By now, he's been player, exhibition performer, coach, clinic and training camp organizer, U.S. Worlds promoter, TV color man, Pittsburgh table tennis club owner, and national coach. Anything else he could do in a lifetime? Yep. He became the U.S. PTA president for two terms. Meanwhile, though the ex-Chinese stars have started to come to this country, Danny himself still has some shiny moments. He pairs with Sean O'Neill to win the 1990 U.S. Clothes Doubles, and the two go on to participate in the World Doubles Championship in Seoul, Korea. In 1991, he comes first to the Olympic qualifier, and this gives him a much needed elite Olympic athlete grant that provides health care for his family soon to be enlarged by the arrival of his son, Dan Jr. He joins with Chen Ming Hua and Todd Sawyers to win the 1994 U.S. Open Team Championship and with David Zhuang to win another U.S. Close doubles title. Now, too, he begins to take advantage of his senior status and continues to collect prize money in the majors, 
including both in Stan Kahn's annual Microtron National Seniors Tournament. <coughs> in 1996, there comes another turning point in his life. He moves his family to New Carlisle, Indiana, to take a full-time coaching job in South Bend. And boy, did he know what he was doing. Having recruited promising juniors, he and his helpful assistant coach, Mark Nordby, tell them, look, forget about the ratings. Work on your short game. Serve short. Receive short serves. Learn how to flip. Drop. Also practice teamwork and sportsmanship among your fellow juniors. And wow, the results Danny got from the students. And not just his standout pupil, Mark Kaczynski. That's a little Mark up there. Big Mark. But Joey Cochran, Jared Lynch, AJ and CJ Brewer, and the South Bend's newest U.S. junior team member, Dan Siegel Jr. Oh my God, the USATT must have named Danny Coach of the Year, Year, Year. Such idealism, such energy. You could see it in him years ago. And he still got it. Ladies and gentlemen, this year's Mark Matthews Lifetime Achievement Award Dancing. Since this was a Lifetime Achievement Award, I'd go back in time and, and just go over some of the moments that I've had that, that marked my career. That really, you know, when I think back, I'd say, oh, I remember this, I remember that. So I thought I'd share that with you and go through the timeline that Tim did. We'll probably say a couple of things the same, but from my perspective, it may be a little bit different. Starting in 1972, I never really played table tennis that much. I loved it, but it was just fun. And I played baseball a lot. I had a couple of college offers. And I uh, was thinking about going to college and playing baseball, but I kind of didn't like baseball anymore. I, just, I played it since I was five years old. I was now 18. And I just didn't have the love for baseball. And I had just started getting into table tennis when I was like 16. Started really loving table tennis, but I didn't know where to go. So I finally decided when I graduated high school, it was June, and I thought, well, I think I'm going to give up baseball. I got. I want to. I want to play table tennis and see if I can become really good at this. I kind of got a little bit tired of team sports. I want to do something individual. So in 1972, I moved up to Del Suarez's place in Michigan. Del invited me. He needed a practice partner. He heard I was kind of serious, and that actually was the decision that made me go there. Because Del said, you know, if you really want to practice, you come up to Grand Rapids. I don't have anybody to work with. I thought, wow, here's number two in the United States. I'm playing, I'd like to play the sport. So I moved up to Grand Rapids, gave up baseball. That was my first real moment. Later on, from that June until December, I trained hard with Dell. 1972 team trials. 25 players were there. I was seated 25th. I was the last guy in. Unbelievable to me. Three days later, I was number one. I remember on that ride, Del and I were talking. We were saying, you know, if we really things fall into place, Danny, you never know. We, you might be able to pull, get fifth place, and make the team. And I thought, you never know. Maybe, but it didn't seem like it. So that meant a lot. I want to thank Del Spares out there. Let's give Del a hand because it was really something. And Connie too, she, you know, she had to put up with me. I was living in Todd's room, and then Todd got more, so I had to go. Uh, also, I want to thank Bill Walk from Pittsburgh. When I was playing, Bill sponsored me. You know, we, I had five brothers and three sisters. We didn't have a lot of money. 
and we really couldn't afford it. Bill would give me $100 here, $100 there, and say, go to Cleveland, go to Columbus. You've got to play. You've got to play these tournaments. So thanks a lot, Bill. In 1974 was a moment that I'll never forget. Uh, the U.S. Open was just finished. I was playing pretty well, but I hadn't really made a big mark. But I, I thought I could beat some of these world players. We played Japan in Grand Rapids, and there was about six or 700 people. Dell did a great job promoting it. And I went out, and I beat Tasaka, number 11 in the world, 2-0. I beat Hasegawa, number 4 in the world, 2-0 and I beat Takashima 2-0. And after every match, I ran back into the tennis center, and I called my dad, and I said, Dad, I just beat Hasegawa, he's number four in the world. He said, well, go get the next guy. <laughs> and I went on and got Takashima, and that was a night I'll never forget. You know, I realized I could play with the best in the world, and I was kind of on my way. As we move on to 1976, things weren't so good in table tennis. No money, no opportunities. What are we gonna do? U.S. Open, first prize, $400, 850 entries, semifinals, $100. I thought, I'm playing my butt off, and no one wants to give him any credit or any money. I was broke. I didn't have any money. I said, this has to stop. I sat out that U.S. Open and boycotted it because it really had to stop. I mean, we, it just wasn't right. And uh, that really made a difference in the sport. Next. December, we had $13,500 in prize money. Sometimes you gotta make a stand. 1977, we played Italy. We, in 1975, we lost to Poland, 5-4. Devastating loss, right, Tim? If we, <laughs> if we win that match, we go into the first division. This is the goal of all players, first division. You're, you're up with the big boys. We lost 5-4 to Poland. Against Italy, it was our big match again. We were down 4-2. It didn't look good. I was losing to their number one. I was down 1061. I thought, man, something's got to change. And somehow I changed a couple techniques, won that match, 4 3. Ray Gillen came in. Ray hadn't had too many big wins, but he was tough. Bingo, unbelievable, 4 4. Next match, Ricky against Constantini. Constantini, one hell of a player. Ricky wiped him out, 5 4. We were in the first division. It was actually better. We were so excited. You saw me jumping before. It, this was unbelievable. So that was, uh, we moved into the first division. That was another moment in my life. It was just amazing. Let's see. Uh, also, when, when throughout the years, you have to have some great coaches. And Del Suarez was my first. really helped me a lot. And I really want to thank Hu Shang. Hu Shang was my coach for many years. He, got, you know, he knew how to help us out and was just a great coach. Hu Shang, you're the best, man. You did a great job. Also around this time, Dave and I tried to run the World Championships. Dave Sakai, we worked hard up at Hartford. We got these insurance companies. They actually put up four, we had $500,000 sponsorship, but we needed a million. We never got to the million, it never happened. But Dave and I, we worked on it, we've been friends ever since. Thanks a lot, Dave. Well, when you go through a career, it's not all roses. 1978, I lost to Eric in the final of the Nationals. And if you read up there, it's like a knife in my heart. It was the hardest loss. It hurt so bad, it was beyond description. It hurt for one year. It really hurt for a year. Mainly because I played timid. Eric played fearless. Uh, I was afraid to lose, and I lost. But it helped me a lot because it taught me a lesson. After going through this tough, tough loss, I realized I'll never be afraid to lose again. Never. Because I went to the hardest loss ever, and it wasn't that bad. You know, the sun rose and everything was okay. But it didn't seem like it would. So that was a tough one, but I still remember that. 1980, I got the title back. Oh, I remember I was up 2-0, and I was up 20 to 8 in the third against Eric. And I realized I got back to where I belonged. It was, it, was, it was awesome to get that feeling back. 1982, Eric was playing great in Germany. Finals. Just one heck of a match. Tim said before, first game I lost. The second game, I think I really was down 2014. And I just took some risks. And I won that game somehow. 
It finally came down. Eric was serving in 1916 in the fifth. And I had about 8,000 bucks riding on this because I had a bonus from Butterfly. I didn't ever thought about the money, but he was serving. But my mind was clear. I knew what was going on. And I won five straight points, and I felt it can't get any better than this. It just can't get any better than this. <laughs> I mean, I thought, here you are battling for the U.S. Championship. You're down 16, 19. He's got to serve. This is the most important thing in your life. Somehow, I won five consecutive points on serve. Just, I, it was indescribable. I remember about an hour later, I was taking a shower, and I said, I forgot about the bonus. I got a bonus. I got some real cash. It was awesome. And we go on, 1983 Nationals, Ricky and I, we went our eight doubles in a row. Eight in a row. All right, Ricky, Ricky's here. <laughs> Things started changing then. We go on to 1986. We, put, we played in the world, Ricky and I, and uh, after that, Ricky decided that he couldn't make enough money in table tennis and he was going to quit. He was not going to play anymore. So from 1986 to about 1990, I was just going through the motions. I lost my partner. I lost my practice partner. I lost my traveling companion. And he wasn't playing anymore. It wasn't fun anymore. I don't think I practiced one time from 1986 to 1990. I would rather do, I'd rather do anything but practice because I just hit the wall. You know, my brother didn't play, my other brother didn't play. I went to tournaments by myself. It lost, it was all gone. So we moved from there, just going through the motions. 1990 to 1995, I was the USA Table Tennis President. Good and bad. Very stressful. Very difficult. Uh, but very good because my love for the sport was there. I wanted it to, I wanted it to grow. I wanted the players to be tr treated fairly. I wanted to make sure the prize money was good. I wanted to make sure we had stipends. I took care of the players. And maybe it didn't all work out, but I'll tell you, we were on the right track. But it was, you know, it was my way of giving back to the sport. But I'll tell you, when you work 30 hours a week on table tennis, like with a president, I had no energy to make money in table tennis, so it was a tough financial time. From then on, 1996, now 1996 comes, I lost the election, thank God. <laughs> I was disappointed, but I'll tell you, my dad the next day, he said, Dan, you look better, you look good. He said, you've been looking stressed for a long, long time. And I really did, I mean, I was disappointed that I lost, but I'll tell you, the relief was indescribable, indescribable. So that was, you know, but it would hurt a little bit because I really felt I had a plan for the association. 1996 comes along, struggling financially, thinking, what the hell am I going to do? 42 years old or whatever, what can I do? Can't really win tournaments. Got to travel around all the time to make money. What am I going to do? South Bend. Offered me a job. I said, no, nah, I'm a Pittsburgh guy. I can't leave my family. I can't do that. And then I said, well, I started thinking about it. I said, well, what am I going to do? I mean, I financially, I've got to do something. So I ended up taking that job. And I thought, well, it would be nice to take a job and coach all day and then go home at night. Because I, I wasn't able to do that. I was always on the road and I missed my kids. So I took the South Bend job and never regretted it. 2000. Great moment for me. I was named the U.S. Olympic coach. Got to go to the Olympics in Sydney. Just a wonderful experience. 2004. This is pretty amazing to me. You know, I worked with Mark for about eight years, and uh, he made the Olympic team. I was the Olympic coach. It was a very proud moment. It was you know to go to the Olympics. Only three men.